So all I need is for people to keep buying my printers and then we can keep making awesome things. Wow, well, nice presentation. I'd like to see this input shaping. Absolutely, will do, as soon as I have it. You don't have it? And yet you have the audacity to send out machines anyway and you just expect people to trust you're gonna add it? Apparently? Look man, the point is, there's a lot of new manufacturers out there. Younger than you. Hungrier than you. Younger than you. Like the new fellow out there called Dendrocalamus. He just shipped two printers with input shaping last year. Get input shaping working, then we'll talk. The Mark IV now has input shaping. But it's true, times have changed. When the Mark III first came out about five years ago now, it was an easy recommendation in a sea of then mediocre alternatives that then took years to catch up. But now the tables have turned and it's on Prusa's machines to catch up. But is the classic Prusa recipe still enough to make the Mark IV worth 1200 euros? I'm not convinced yet, so let's explore. Right after a message from today's sponsor, Mintion. The BeagleCam V2 is a plug and play printer host, Wi-Fi add-on, and a time-lapse camera. Control and manage your printer fleet remotely through the BeaglePrint app, or even without an internet connection for the printer, access each BeagleCam directly. The BeagleCam can automatically create a synchronized time-lapse of your prints, or simply serve as a free-running time-lapse camera, even with no printer attached. Use the included tripod or create a custom rig with any quarter 20 mount and the new V2 version also allows you to tweak focus and to create some of that sweet bokeh. You can find more info on the BeagleCam V2 and the all new LaserCam for laser cutters in the description below. Even though they've dropped the Prusa Mendel i3 part of the name, the Prusa Mark IV is still a continuation of the Mendel heritage of Prusa's printers and as such the basic design stays the same, moving bed and all. And it does feel a lot like the Mark III, even though almost every part of the machine has been swapped, upgraded or changed in some way. Right at the front you've now finally got a full color graphic screen. It is finally being run by a modern 32-bit ST microprocessor. The hot end gets an upgrade over the V6 and it's now a custom leak-proof design, still made by E3D and sharing some design details with Revo, but now you can choose between using quick swappable nozzle brakes or an adapter with standard V6 nozzles. It's still an all-metal design that isn't going to eventually fail like Teflon lined hot ends and it can still print anything from PLA to polycarbonate. The inductive bed sensor for auto leveling has been replaced by a load cell that directly uses the nozzle to probe the bed so it gets the bed offset perfect every time even if you swap bed sheets or you know you want to print on some thicker exotic surface. The extruder is an all new design. The Mark IV now has Wi-Fi built in. It has better stepper motors. It still keeps almost all the features that made the Mark III unique like those magnetic PI coated beds power fault resume, uh, built-in diagnostics, and of course, Prusa Slicer. And still, in practice, it's a printer that ends up feeling very familiar and almost nostalgic. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's unwrap this one by one, starting with arguably the most important thing about any 3D printer, print quality. It's totally fine. Dimensionality has always been spot on with the Prusa machines, and this one is no different. And overall, it maintains the same high level of print quality that we used to from the Mark III. The claim is that the new stepper motors, on X and Y particularly, have eliminated the VFA artifacts that the Mark III was sometimes showing, but that is only partially true. The Mark IV now uses 0.9 degree motors that have twice the physical resolution as your standard 1.8 degree stepper. But while that seems to have fixed that slight, very fine artifact VFA washboarding in some spots, it now shows up in other spots as even higher frequency artifacts. Just like edge ringing, this is mostly a cosmetic blemish, but I'm, I'm a bit irritated that it's still showing up even though the new motors were supposed to eliminate it. Now, there was a set of very early Mark IVs that was built with a faulty batch of motors. So, just to make sure, I got in touch with customer support chat, they checked my machine's serial number and motor lot codes and told me my motors are fine. So, I guess this is just how the machine prints out of the box. Of course, 
At the time of me filming this review, you can also opt to switch up that out-of-the-box experience and install the in-development alpha version of the input shaping firmware. That's right, the machine's been out for a couple of months and it's not even done yet. And I can see why the input shaping firmware is still in alpha. It's not very good. Sure, you get a significant speed boost and both corner ringing and any sign of the VFA washboarding is just completely gone. But you traded for this lower frequency warbling and an overall loss of detail. Sure, the classic firmware, which is actually this one, has more ringing, but I find the crisp, slightly ringy stock prints much more pleasing to look at than this. If you'll allow, maybe we should take a quick excursion into what input shaping even is. Basically, it's a purely software feature that allows the printer to sort of anticipate how the X and Y axes are going to actually move with the inherent mechanical properties of a movement axis, like its motor and belt elasticity, like springiness and damping, and the axis's weight. Because the machine already knows how an axis should ideally move, and it can now also approximate how it's most likely actually going to move, it can introduce small counter movements to compensate for a part of that unwanted slop or bounce. But for this to work, input shaping requires the firmware to know exactly how a specific axis is going to behave, and the standard approach to that is to add an accelerometer to the tool head that can measure how the tool head is going to respond to inputs from the motors. With a moving bed, of course, you would need to add one to the tool head and to the moving bed. But the Mark IV doesn't have any way to measure the dynamics of its axes. The main board does have a connector for an accelerometer, but it doesn't ship with one, and as far as I can tell, the firmware currently doesn't support it. Instead, Prusa trusts their consistency with assembled printers so much that they ship one universal pre-made tuning for all printers. And on mine, that tune makes prints turn out arguably worse than without input shaping. Which is odd, because one of the main points about input shaping on the Mark IV was that it wasn't going to boost print speeds into the realms of a Core XY machine, but instead focused on improving quality while providing just a little bit of a speed boost too. Now, again, this is still a pre-release alpha preview of input shaping on the Mark IV, so it's not finished yet. But, you know, this is a printer that is shipping and that you can buy right now. So I can only assess what's already available. So either we look at it as if it doesn't have input shaping, or, you know, we look at what's already there. But if we do want to take a look into the crystal ball, you know, there are ways to tune input shaping without an accelerometer physically present, namely sets of test prints that the machine could do itself, and then you look at the prints and you tell the machine, hey, this section looked better than this one. Still, an accelerometer would have been way easier, and they're not that expensive. I know this was a concern from the beginning, but I wanted to see how well it would actually work before I jump into conclusions. And yeah, as it turns out, with this machine and the current pre-release firmware, it very much is a problem. The Mark IV also runs completely new electronics, and it's part of a unified hardware platform first introduced with the Mini, and now also used in the Excel, Print Farm, and of course, this Mark IV. There's no Raspberry Pi or anything running in here. Uh, the entire printer, including input shaping, is handled by an STM32, and Wi-Fi is added with an ESP01 at the back of the machine. Where is it? Right here. The input shaping code, from what I know, is based on Clipper's code, but of course, without requiring a separate Linux board. I do appreciate the physical Ethernet port. It's right down here. That tends to be a lot more reliable than Wi-Fi and is also heaps easier to set up. Plug in and you're ready to go. Especially since the Wi-Fi setup on the Mark IV is pretty inelegant. Typically, you just connect to Wi-Fi directly from the machine screen, or you use OneTouch WPS, or you connect to the machine's hotspot with your phone, and then, you know, you use that to set up the network on the machine itself. On the Mark IV, you instead open the help article with your phone, then tell the Mark IV to generate a config file on the USB drive, you take that drive over to a computer, edit the file with your Wi-Fi name and password, and plug it back into the Mark IV. I mean... It works, but... 
The rest of the user interface and user experience feels done in a similar vein. It's highly functional and you can tell the folks making this know their way around 3D Prints as well and the way they're designing the user interface does have some intent behind it. Both are things that you can't really take for granted. Though both the display on the machine and Prusa Slice on the desktop have that distinct Eastern European Brutalisk Panelux style. It gets you exactly what you want very effectively, but it definitely does not have that Apple-esque smoothness to it. The screen on the printer is a touchscreen. You can enable a touch-based interface if you prefer that, but I like the physical click wheel that the printer gives you. And since the UI is built with that physical input in mind, it does work really well. Speaking of Prusa Slicer, it's incredibly good. I've already made a video about the changes that the current 2.6 version introduced. And as I've always said, aside from the printer itself functioning, the slicer will make the biggest difference in how much you're going to enjoy using any particular 3D printer. Now, the rest of the plan is simple. I design a cheap 3D printer that people can build. I sell a better version of that 3D printer. I hire people and build a company. I give away my software and designs to my competition. Wait, what? But because Prusa Slicer is open source, you now can get the exact same Prusa Slicer experience with an Anycubic Research or Bamboo Labs machine too. Instead of publishing as open source, Prusa could have spent their time on developing a closed source UI that would at first still use the open source slick 3 r project in the background, and then eventually replace that too with something proprietary so that they would end up with their own lockdown software suite. Instead, they decided to keep publishing as open source and to keep adding to open source projects, which is laudable, but ultimately means that in the current market, Prusa Slicer just isn't a distinguishing factor anymore because every manufacturer can and is using it. Again, great for users, but not so great for making the Mark IV more desirable than the alternatives. My full thought on that in the last video. Moving on, there's also Prusa Connect and Prusa Link now. Uh, Prusa Link is the network local option that runs on the machine itself, which is great because it doesn't depend on anyone else's server staying online for it to function. Of course, you can only connect to it and to the machine as long as you're in the same network, and it gives you a separate web interface for every machine if you have more than one. If you want a consolidated print farm interface, then Prusa Connect is the cloud solution for that. I've briefly tried both, but I think what you'll end up using most is Prusa Link with the option to send files to the Mark IV directly from Prusa Slicer. That is just the most convenient feature, but of course, aside from temperatures and print progress, the Mark IV lacks the option to actually check in and see your prints remotely. There's no webcam on the Mark IV yet, but there are talks about eventually supporting an ESP camera module. For the time being though, you can hook up an old phone and use that as an integrated webcam in the web interface. Now, with the Prusa machines, what makes them unique and even worth looking at at all at this point is not the headlining features, because let's face it, the things that are new about the Mark IV versus the Mark III aren't things that are never before seen. Instead, and this is something that the Mark IV still does very well, is that the stuff that is there usually is pretty well thought out and the way it's being done is ultimately well iterated and fine-tuned. And that is something that's hard to formulate into a review or advertise as a feature on a product web page. Sure, there's also stuff that you can list out, like the carried over Trinamic drivers, flexible magnetic PEI powder coated print beds, now in even more option one even for PA for nylon specifically, the filament sensor that's built in, you have built-in diagnostics, you have crash detection, though that doesn't work together with input shaping, you have power fault resume, a good slicer. Those are all things that add to the overall experience, but the rest of the market is catching up very quickly. And I'm not sure if 1200 euros is still justifiable for this machine, especially considering that, you know, looking at the comments under these videos, People don't seem to care much for things like sustainability, where Prusa publish an audit report for their machines, and the fact that it's made and developed locally here in the EU, which does add cost. With the way that the Mark IV is spec'd, it does have its applications where it's going to be a perfect fit. And for me, because I already have it, it's probably going to become my main workhorse too. 
as with basically any review on the internet these days, yes, this machine was provided free of charge, but I have never and will never allow payment or editorial input from manufacturers for these reviews. Prusa is actually first seeing this review at the same time that you are. Otherwise, you know, these sort of things just wouldn't be reviews. But the question is, would I personally buy a Mark IV at this point? Probably not. With a lot of things, I'm a bit of a cheapskate, and I would probably get some sort of Ender, Sovol, or Elegu machine, throw some core upgrades on there, like a proper hot end at the very least, and I'd just deal with whatever little issues or annoyances that machine might then have in the long run. Yes, I'd occasionally get annoyed with it, probably, but I think that would be very bearable for having spent a third of the money up front. For situations where you have to have a machine that just keeps on working, the Mark IV, or honestly, you know, even still a Mark III can and does make sense. But that's the sort of buyer who would also consider spending for an Ultimaker. But for DIY tinkerers like me, or probably you as you're watching this video, the Mark IV just doesn't seem to provide the, the oomph, the excitement, the bragging rights that you would expect to get at this price point in 2023. Two years ago, this would have been an absolute baller machine. Today, it's still conventionally good, but only conventionally good just isn't that special anymore. I hope they figure out input shaping on the Mark IV because this just this just doesn't look good. Uh, if you do have a Mark IV and if you've tried the Alpha firmware, uh, please do leave a comment below with how well it has been working out for you. As always, thank you to my supporters on Patreon and YouTube memberships who make it possible for me to do this. To everyone, thank you for watching, keep on making, and I'll see you in the next one after a bit of a summer break.